It is Tuesday, February 20th, 2018. My name is Ashton Ellett. I'm here with another installment of the Two-Party Georgia Oral History Project, sponsored by the Richard B. Russell Library at the University of Georgia. Joining me today is Mr. Bill Nygut of Georgia Public Broadcasting, a fellow Illinoisan. Mr. Nygut is currently Senior Executive Producer at GPB, where he's also host of Two-Way Street and Political Rewind. He's also served as the Southeast Regional Director for the Anti-Defamation League between 2006 and 2013, as well as CEO of the Metro Atlanta Arts and Culture Coalition from 2004 until 2007. He spent the bulk of his career as a political reporter for WSB-TV here in Atlanta, covering local, state, and national politics. Uh, he usually gets to ask all the questions, um, but he, <laughs> he's being so kind and generous to, to allow me to do that today. Um, so thank you. Thank you very much, Bill. For Hi, Ashton. Time. I'm glad to be with you. Really do appreciate the, the, the time and the, the insights you're going to be able to provide. Uh, but first, tell us a little bit about growing up in Illinois, growing up in Chicago, in Chicago land. Yeah, I grew up in the other end of the state from you. You were down there in Carbondale, so, southern Illinois. Yes. I grew up in, <clears throat> excuse me, I grew up in the northern suburbs of Chicago, Skokie, Illinois. Uh, at the time I grew up there, uh, we were a, uh, a heavily Jewish uh, community. The joke was that Skokie was the garden capital of America because there was a Rosenblum on every corner. <laughs> um, but I, I, so I grew up in Skokie. I started uh, my career in uh, journalism <clears throat> after having been an actor for uh, quite a while. Um, but gravitated towards journalism and in the uh, earliest stages of my career worked for both the NBC owned station in Chicago, which was uh, Channel 5 WMAQ, right. and then subsequently for Channel 7, which was the uh, ABC owned station. While I was at the uh, ABC station, I um, began covering local politics as a reporter. And in those days, that was a pretty exciting beat. Oh, yeah. It yep. was the, the uh, Chicago City Council was uh, the only uh, local government uh, in, in the United States, to our knowledge, those of us who covered it, that had a gallery uh, separated from the floor of the council by bulletproof glass <laughs> <laughs> because this was Chicago. It, politics ain't beanbag. Yeah, you know, politics ain't beanbag. You're exactly right. So I spent a good deal of time uh, covering politics at City Hall in Chicago, and that was great, great fun. W when was that? When when were you covering uh, the late seventies and the early eighties? So I actually, yeah. uh, a little bit earlier in my career, I actually was working in journalism in Chicago uh, at at the NBC station when. Uh, the mayor, Richard J. Daley, the great, great Richard J. Old Daley, was Daly, still alive yeah. and still mayor of the city um, long before his son, who we called Richie, became mayor. <laughs> but um, the last campaign I covered in Chicago was particularly poignant for me. It was the campaign in which Harold Washington, a uh, very famous campaign, was running for mayor. He was the first serious African-American candidate for mayor that the city had seen. He was a great and inspired leader. And covering his campaign was a thrilling opportunity. But it was also frightening because we would go with Harold into neighborhoods, white neighborhoods on the northwest side right. of what was a very segregated city. and. Uh, it was not unusual for people in the crowd to throw things at him, uh, bottles, rocks, sometimes uh, uh, even more. I mean, I remember a brick being tossed at, at Harold's way at one point. The racial animosity in that race was uh, pretty overwhelming. Uh, so what's interesting about it, of course, Harold won and became right. mayor. And it was about the time that, that that all took place, that the election took place, that I began having conversations with WSB here in Atlanta about the possibility of coming down here. They were looking for somebody who they thought was going to be, they talked about it as kind of a showcase reporter, a guy they could put on the top story of the day, 
they had seen some of my work in Chicago and um, th they liked what they saw, so they, they made a big pitch that I would have an opportunity to be their featured guy. But here's why I tell you this story. When I announced to the newsroom in Chicago that I was moving to Atlanta, to Georgia, an awful lot of people who I knew well came up to me <clears throat> and said, how can you possibly move to the racist South? And <laughs> I said to them, did, did we all just live through the same mayor's race? I mean, I didn't know Georgia. I didn't know Atlanta. Of course I knew about the history of this state. But I certainly knew that I had seen the most frightening, uh, uh, offensive display of racism you could possibly imagine in covering the mayor's race in Chicago. So I was always interested in the way people saw my move to the South. I want to take a step back for sure. a second. What trick you mentioned you you were you know in acting or, or yeah an attempted actor yeah. um, seeking a second career in politics was there something you know growing up in, in in your family that a lot of people you know they they come up through these political families or yeah. politically engaged yeah. families was that was was that your story as well? Uh, my father, who grew up in Cleveland, uh, had been a a, a, a a on a journalism track. He had studied journalism at Miami University in Oxford, Ohio. He was the editor of the Miami newspaper, and he was really on track to go into journalism and ended up in business for a variety of reasons instead. But he always was a, a, a a great, great advocate for the importance of journalism in our world. And in fact, he and I, when I was a young adult, uh, both were involved in helping the founder of what at the time, and this would have been mid-70s, uh, what became the first really important journalism uh, 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 or. Uh, what would have become the first real journalism magazine, the Chicago Journalism Review, which in the mid-70s was reporting in both positive and critical ways on how journalism was being practiced in Chicago. Journalism in Chicago, yeah. Was this well, during, I grew up during with the four daily newspapers? Right, exactly, with the Tribune, the Sun Tribune Times. and the Sun Times in the morning and the Daily News and the Chicago American, which became the Chicago Today later on. Which, you know, you, you mentioned that, you know, I always grew up hearing about the Chicago newspapers and everything, but we were mentioning off camera that, you know, where I grew up in southern Illinois, yeah. it was actually six, seven hours south, you know, every, everything. You, we're all St. Louis Cardinals fans yeah. down in my part, <laughs> my part of Illinois, which yeah. means well, I grew I'm up. Well, I'm very sorry for you, Ashton. Yeah, well, you know, <laughs> we, we have to give you one every century right. or so just to keep it an interesting <laughs> uh, <laughs> competition. But tell me about coming down to Atlanta. Uh, how did you, how did you uh, sort of immerse yourself or inculcate yourself in, in the politics of Atlanta, the politics of the South? That's a great question. Uh, so uh, let me set the stage, if sure. I could. <clears throat> I came here in the fall of 1983. Um, Joe Frank Harris was in his first term as governor. Thomas B. Murphy was already speaker of the Georgia House, the legendary Thomas B. Murphy. Zell Miller mm -hmm. was lieutenant governor of the state senate. Uh, Andy Young was mayor of Atlanta. So I came in at a time when there were some remarkable people uh, leading our state and our city. And uh, I set out to get to know them as best I could um, because although I was brought in as, as, a, as a, what they call a general assignment reporter, there was no question that I was gonna specialize in politics to right. the extent that I could. Uh, I got to know Andy Young fairly quickly and I have to tell you, that was one of the most thrilling parts of moving south. I was in high school and college as the civil rights movement was unfolding down here. I wasn't a part of it. Um, I watched it from afar as an observer. But of course I saw Martin Luther King. I saw Ralph Abernathy Jr. I saw Hosea Williams. I saw John Lewis. 
Um, I saw Andrew Young and all of those other extraordinary civil rights leaders uh, as they went through uh, the trials and tribulations and successes of the movement. To move down here and suddenly get to know these exceptional leaders like Andy Young, like Hosea, like John Lewis, um, was thrilling in a way that I can't even describe. These were heroes who I suddenly was interacting with fairly regularly. When I first got here, Andy Young actually, uh, one day, took me on a drive to his neighborhood in southwest Atlanta. You know, there's a corridor down there southwest that, that it, this, is a this is a segregated city geographically, clearly. Right, right. And there are any number of white people who've grown up here, lived here for many years, who have no idea what the neighborhoods along Cascade Road right. uh, are like. But Andy had a house down there. And he took me down to see his neighborhood and tried to encourage me to buy a house down there. And I said, you know, I'm not right, quite ready. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor, but I don't think the time is right for me to come down this way. But the point is, I, so I got to know him. Um, I had interesting experiences early on. I knew that if I was going to end up, my goal was to eventually uh, become a full-time political reporter. Uh, in the mid 80s, early 80s or so, that was not something that Channel 2 particularly was really eager to have. They, they didn't want a full-time political guy. Uh, but I did everything I could to make sure that when politics was big news that I would be on top of it. So I remember uh, having established a relationship with the then mayor of Atlanta, Andy Young. I decided I needed to get to know the people down at the Capitol. Mm -hmm. um, Joe Frank Harris, in his first term, had a chief of staff named Tom Perdue, uh, a tough, hard-bitten political consultant. He would have done well in Chicago. Do he would have been, a, you're absolutely right. Switchblade politics. great politics. in Chicago politics. He was a dirty fighter and an aggressive fighter, and he won whenever he could. For whatever reason, I think Tom, I went to visit him early on in my tenure here, within the first three months that I'd come to Atlanta. And for whatever reason, I think Tom saw me as somebody he, he may have seen me as somebody he could manipulate. A mark. He, yeah, he may have seen me as somebody who he should take in, uh, uh, treat with uh, certain deference in the hopes that I would report favorably on the sure. Joe Frank Harris sure. administration. Whatever his motives were, he brought me deep inside the administration. He gave me stories that nobody else had. Um, part of that, I think, is also he knew I worked for WSB-TV, which was then, as it has been throughout most of its history, the number one station in town. So it had to do with that as well. But Tom gave me, uh, from the very beginning of my relationship with him, some really significant stories. So I, I, I got that relationship. I also got to know Joe Frank and Elizabeth, his wife, and um, without, you know, without regard to politics, uh, they were just plain lovely people. <laughs> you know, we, we, we say they're good Christian people from Cartersville. Well, Joe Frank Harris has been fairly or unfairly maligned throughout history yeah. as, as sort of the, the boring governor. Yeah. yeah. Well, Bill, this, this, Bill Shipp said he, he was something like warmed over grits. He was not an exciting guy, let's face it. Uh, but that didn't mean he wasn't a lovely person. And his wife, Elizabeth, was uh, very gracious. Uh, so I began covering them uh, a bit. And again, with Tom Perdue's help, got some stories that made news. Um, when Vince Dooley was in the headlines because there was talk that he was going to run for the United States Senate. Right, 1986. Tom, yeah, this was a few years later, but as an example of the kind of stories I was able to get, Purdue called me into his office the day before. Uh, Vince announced he wasn't running and said, you got it first. We just talked to Dooley, he's not gonna run for Senate. And we were able to go on the air that night at six and report exclusively that Vince Dooley was not running for Senate. Again, we were channel two. So it, maybe it could have been John Joe Smith 
who <laughs> got that story. But I was fortunate that I worked people like that as they were working me and got important stories. Well, let's, let's talk about that. You, you mentioned that WSB wasn't necessarily looking for a full-time political no. reporter or a political shop. No. W was that because political reporting in the city and state had, had for so long been the domain of the Atlanta Constitution and the Atlanta Journal? Yeah. Or, or what I, was the dynamic there? It is certainly WSB was not the exception. Local TV stations across the country don't think that their viewers want politics. Gotcha. They, 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 they know they want politics a little bit, kind of, but they're not going to, uh, in those days, in the mid-80s, they were not ready to turn someone like me into a full-time political reporter. They needed people who'd go out and cover car crashes and right. apartment fires. And I, I don't think there's anything unusual about Channel 2 in that regard. Um, but let me, if I can, I, yeah. let, me, let me go back a little. So, so I got to know Joe Frank. I got to know Andy Young. But one of my favorite people to get to know was Tom Murphy. And I r remember a day in that first session that I was down there in 1984. Early in the session, I went down the Capitol on a Saturday morning just to sort of wander around to get to know the building a little better. And uh, I wandered into the speaker's suite up on the third floor of the Capitol only to learn that Murphy and what they used to call the Green Door Committee, yeah. all of those good old boys, Bubba McDonald. Oh, yeah. Uh, who were some of those? I, those names should not escape me. Um, De Denmark Groover. Uh, uh, they were all together. Culver Kid. Culver Kid. The was Silver Fox. Absolutely. They were all in a meeting in the speaker's conference room. To this day, I have no idea why they were there on a Saturday, but they were. So I sat in the uh, outer lobby of that suite, and I waited for him to come out. And I said to Tom Murphy, Mr. Speaker, you met me once, but again, my name is Bill Nygut. I'm here from Chicago. I said, <laughs> you know, and I've already heard all the stories about you, uh, that you're, you know, uh, a devious and corrupt kind of guy. <laughs> I said, I come from Chicago, Mr. Speaker. There's no way you could be anywhere near what the people were that I covered. And he thought that was funny. They invited me to go to lunch, the whole Green Door Committee, and we went to Harold's Barbecue <laughs> down by the Atlanta Federal Prison. And that lunch firmed up for me relationships with them that allowed me to report on them. And the reporting wasn't always friendly, but it gave me access to them. And it was the sort of work I believed in doing to pave the way for getting stories and having access to the leaders of the state. I guess we, we can jump ahead for sure. a little bit just because of what you brought up there. Is that still the case? in terms of political journalism, that, that <clears throat> all it takes is, is a lunch down at Harold's Barbecue with the speaker and his, 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 his floor leaders and lieutenants uh, to, to build relationships and gain access? Or has the, the nature of political journalism changed since, since 1983 when you got down here in Georgia? Uh, I, I think generalizing about that can be problematic. Okay. I, I do think it's certainly true that um, the media is under more scrutiny than ever before, obviously, and there are certain political leaders, there are certain, there are certain members of the legislature, city council, in, again, not just here in Georgia, but around the country, who don't trust and don't want to talk to the media. Mm -hmm. um, I get that. Um, but it's always been true that there are some political, uh, some elected officials who understand the, I want to call it the game, but I don't mean that dismissively. Right, right. You know, I, I could go through a, a list of the people that I've covered over the years who get it that there are times I'm going to report critically on them. And after a critical story appears on Channel 2, come back and we still get along. Right. Because they get it. Uh, and that's always been the case. And there are always those political leaders who are thin-skinned, who think that our job is to only give them positive coverage, 
And after you run a critical story about them, they can be very difficult and may shut the door on you. I, I don't think that dynamic has changed, um, despite the fact that there's certainly more uh, negative attention uh, brought on the media today than, than there ever was before. Um, Weiss Fowler was a very tough guy to cover because uh, as much as I liked Weich as a person and as uh, talented as he was as, a, as an elected leader, mm -hmm. uh, he said he, Weich didn't like it when he, you wrote a negative piece about him or aired a negative piece about him. He would tend to yell at you. He would call you up and swear at you on the phone. <laughs> directly and, and, and not through his, oh, his, no, his no. press off. No, no, no. He liked to do it directly. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and, and that's fine. He was passionate. Uh, about his role, and he was uh, fighting always uh, for the best coverage possible. But, you know, that's part of the process. Bill Shipp, uh, yeah. in, a, in a previous interview. Um, the for, great Bill Shipp. The, the, the dean of Georgia <laughs> political reporters. Um, what he said was the media manipulates the politicians, and the politicians manipulate the media. Sure. You know, and Shipp, that's the game. That's right. But that's right. And Shipp. Uh, it's a balancing act. I think that when I see political reporters who come in determined to make their bones by playing gotcha all the time, the fact that they're being tough, the fact that they're challenging in an aggressive way an elected official doesn't make them better at their job than the people who understand that there's no reason you can't have a mutually respectful relationship in which you can still ask hard questions. It, 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 the idea is if you can convince the people you cover that you will be fair-minded, that you're not looking to undermine them, uh, that you're not looking just to make your reputation on the basis of how you attack them. Right. Hey, that's better for democracy, I think. The sort of balancing the, the short-term gain of the gotcha interview right. versus the, the longer-term yes. relationship yes. that you're talking about. There were times, there are time, I believe there were times when I had stories um, about particular political leaders that were devastatingly critical of them, in, in which there was maybe uh, corruption involved. I always turned those stories over to our investigative people because I felt that was their job. Um, maintaining as pe best I could a relationship with political figures uh, gave us access to them uh, in a way that I thought was ridiculous to undermine. And as long as these stories came out, I didn't care if I got credit for them. How, how has social media um, and sort of not the new media, but social media changed journalism and political journalism in particular with you know, the democratizing effects of Facebook and Twitter where yeah. you can go around the media as, as, as the, yeah. our current president yeah. does uh, on a daily basis. How has that changed the role of the political journalist? Well, I'll tell you the first thing is it makes you work a lot harder because you better be tweeting, you better be posting on your newspaper or your TV station right. website. You, you know, so uh, just from that point of view first. Okay, so I covered a lot of national politics. I right. spent a lot of time out on the road covering presidential candidates starting back in 84, actually, the, um, the Walter Mondale uh, uh, campaign. I covered him. Uh, pretty extensively, didn't spend much time with Reagan. And you know, one of the things that be about being on the road in the mid 80s to the night through the most of the 90s was uh, satellite technology was such that satellites were uh, expensive. Trying to get an uplink and get your story back was expensive, prohibitively expensive. And satellite uh, facilities, trucks, were not ubiquitous as they became. Right. So we could go on the road in 88 and 92 and go into New York City, and um, it was kind of a cushy gig. You'd get a satellite window at a prohibitive cost at five to six to feed back a story, 
Uh, maybe a second story for the 11 o'clock show. Do a quick live shot at 6 with your story sandwiched in between, and then you'd have the night off. <laughs> Pretty nice, because they didn't want to spend the money. By 96 and 2000, satellites became ubiquitous, and the cost was cheap. So all of a sudden, when you're covering, uh, these, when you're out there spending Cox Communications money, they want you on the air in the morning show at noon at 5, 6, and 11. And suddenly it's a lot of work. Right. <laughs> now, that's fine because it's an exciting job. But in a way, social media has accelerated the workload of journalists, too. Right. Who have to tweet frequently, who have to post on the website, or they have to post blogs. So just from a workload point of view, it's had a big impact on how we work or how journalists, I don't do that day-to-day -day stuff anymore. As far as the impact of content, uh, you're right. I mean, clearly, uh, the president doesn't really care as much about, I mean, he. let me say that a different way. The president understands he can talk directly to the American people. Uh, he doesn't have to talk to guys like me unless he figures he can get something out of us. I mean, I, I think it's self-evident that social media has changed enormously how people consume news and how figures in the news take advantage of those direct channels to talk over the heads of journalists. Right. Okay, so you, you covered through WS, with WSB TV <clears throat> Georgia politics for about 20, 20 years. years. I did 20 years. 20 years. You, you did your 20. Yeah. <laughs> the, the grand sweeping question, how did Georgia politics change over those 20 years? Yeah, and then, a, we, and then we, can, we can dig down into the specifics. Well, I mean, um, so take Georgia and try to isolate it from the national scene, although right. that's hard to do. I mean, clearly the country as a whole became more conservative. Sure. But that said, remember that Georgia Democrats, like most Southern Democrats, have always been conservative. Right. So it isn't as if there was a sweeping change in terms of philosophy. Uh, the liberal Demo Georgia Democrats were swept out of power by conservative Republicans. Right. The turning point came, began with, uh, in, during the tenure of Roy Barnes as governor. Uh, Roy was a, Roy was a governor who was full of ideas. I mean, just had incredible number of ideas for how to reform education, particularly education, mm -hmm. uh, how to make the state uh, more friendly for business, changing the flag. I mean, this was a guy who came into office with a long list of things he wanted to accomplish, right. as you know. Uh, but he and his chief of staff, Bobby Kahn, uh, overreached in their first term. He, you know, we're talking a lot these days about reapportionment. We're talking about um, gerrymandering. And for the most part, we talk about how Republicans have taken control of legislatures around the country, and they have through gerrymandering. Right. Um, but Barnes was, but Bobby Kahn led one of the most egregious mm -hmm. Uh, Talking the, the 2001, yeah, to to make to ma to assure they felt democratic control of Georgia for decades to come, and a, and a, and it bit them in the behind. So did the flag issue. Mm -hmm. So did the way Barnes talked about teachers. So there were this whole accumulation of uh, factors that accrued to a governor who really did have a vision for making Georgia a better place, but probably moved faster than, well, certainly than voters were going to tolerate. Right, right. Uh, and so he, in, in some ways, he set the state. And in doing that, uh, he took on policies that conservative voters wouldn't have seen as friendly uh, uh, to them. 
you know, changing the flag was a huge issue. I don't think, I don't think it's the reason he lost re-election. There were other factors, but it certainly it played a, a role. It is a reason. It, well, Zell Miller was, was, I guess, politically canny enough to, to back off. Well, yes, but remember, Zell at one point talked about changing the flag, too. And had, right. Right, and then had to back away. That's what, I get it. You're saying right, that. Right, right, right. Um, so I think that, uh, I think that with, with, with Roy kind of leading the charge, uh, more and more white voters, that old yellow dog coalition, mm-hmm began looking around and saying, maybe the Democrats <laughs> are not really working in our interests. And I think the snowball effect happened. <clears throat> and I do think that the, that the expansion of the Republican Party, uh, the voter base of the Republican Party around the country helped here, uh, help voters think about, well, maybe it's time uh, we look at Republican candidates. Um, well, you, you mentioned the Republican Party. You, you, you came here in 1983, and, and if I'm counting up the number of, of, of Republican legislators yeah, there under was the Gold Dome, maybe nothing. two yeah. dozen, three dozen. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, maybe. Right. It, um, how did how did you watch the growth and development of, of the Republican Party over over that period? Because they were they were practically a non-entity. Well, in again, the early I, 80s. I do think that that probably started in Washington. Okay. I do think that you can't underestimate the impact of a Newt Gingrich on um, people's thinking about whether Democrats were operating in their best interests or not across the country, including here in Georgia. Um, Newt's contract with America was really savvy marketing on his part. And I think it helped uh, people in states like Georgia reconsider whether Democrats really were operating in their best interest. It also became, I think, increasingly, I think white Georgians, especially rural and, and some suburban Georgians increasingly saw the Democratic Party as playing to the interests of uh, the African American community. Sure, sure. Uh, which was true to some extent. Right. Um, and, I, and I think, so I think we came to the point in this state where conservatives, we no longer identified Democrats as being, having the conservative values that Republicans did. Does that? Right. We, you know, in the 1970s, 1980s, the, the, the Republican Party is the, is the party of uh, the Paul Coverdell, yep. uh, Kill Towns, and yep. uh, yep. Bob Irvin, yep. the, the Buckhead Republican Party. That's exactly party. right. It, that's a really good point. Uh, Not the kind of guys who you go down to Adel and win voters <laughs> over right. with. Very, very, very smart, <laughs> talented politicians. Yep. Um, but you, you're talking about Roy Barnes, you know, 2002. Statewide is elected. The statewide elections, uh, Sonny Purdue. Yep. From Bonaire. Yep. Now down in Houston County, and 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 Saxby Chambliss yeah. from from Moultrie. Yeah. What did that mean t- for the Republican Party and for the the changing face and and maybe twang of Georgia politics? Well, I mean, again, I think that's all part of this notion that people like the ones you mentioned uh, helped voters reassess whether Democrats were uh, acting in their right. in their best interest. Now, I will also say, though, um, we were down in uh, Savannah to do Political Rewind a couple weeks ago, and um, one of our guests was uh, Eric Johnson, Republican state senator who mounted a, a, a pretty substantial yep. uh, race for governor back in 2010. Third, third place. Um did pretty well. Just out of, just out of just the runoff. Out, yes, just missed the runoff. And one of the questions we asked Eric, and I think it's one that people in this state are going to be asking is, yes, you had a Saxby Chambliss, um, f- well and good, you had a Sonny Purdue, but as Metro Atlanta increases its power in the state, are we going to get back to a place where a candidate for statewide office has uh, who lives in rural Georgia or outside metro can actually win election and i think that's an open question today well, it, i mean it's a, it's it's an excellent question 
a very real possibility of 16, 12 to 16 years of governors from Gainesville, Georgia. Yeah. I, it, that's a very real possibility yeah. if Lieutenant yeah. Governor Casey Cable yeah. is elected. I, I don't know. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's, um, I, th I felt like I was lucky uh, to get to watch, especially two governors. Uh, Barnes was one of them because I do think he was a creative thinker and had progressive ideas which were uh, meaningful and, and might have had a big impact in a positive way in the state, but they also doomed him. But I also was fortunate to have watched Zell Miller for eight years. Right. And Miller was, I just did a dinner for, there's a, you know, his grandson, Brian, has mm -hmm. the Zell Miller Institute right. now right. to advance Zell's reputation, his philosophy of government. And I, I was just asked to uh, MC the, the annual dinner they did, and, and Carvel and Mary Matlin came in to be part of it. And we spent the evening just sort of talking about Zell and his legacy. And it reminded me of what an extraordinary impact he had in a positive way on the state of Georgia. He again, this is why, you know, you, you talk about the relationship of reporters to politicians. Uh, there were times when Zell did things that deserved uh, being reported on very critically. But if your whole approach to him was to always play gotcha, you were missing the fact that this was also a guy who did some of the most progressive and important things that the state could have had. And uh, it, was an, it was really a privilege to get to watch him for eight years. We should talk about Zell a yeah, little bit if you I, want. I, you, you're exactly right. You know, on the one hand, you have a governor who, who brought the lottery to yeah. the Deep South, which it, we, we take it for granted today that you can go out and buy a Powerball ticket or yeah. a Mega Millions ticket or a scratch off, and, and that's just taken for granted. But it wasn't but, just that he brought the lottery. It was, it was the way he packaged and understood <laughs> the lottery, right? Right, right. In Illinois, for example, we have the lottery, and you know, it's supposed to go to schools. And they, but it was a very obvious package that voters could look at and say, I'm voting for the Hope Scholarship. Here's what, yeah. Here's what Zell Not did. Not the lottery, Here's what Zell did. Zell was fortunate that he had uh, uh, some experiences of other states before him. Right. So other states, Florida, uh, could say, oh, we're going to start a lottery and the money will be uh, ear earmarked for education. But what was happening is, yes, it was earmarked for education. But because it was a big pot of money, it allowed legislators right. to cut back on the appropriation, the general appro budget appropriation for education to rely on education f lottery funds. Zell Miller with the help of James Carville and Paul mm -hmm. Vigala, came up with a different plan, as you know, and their plan was brilliant. It, the lottery money would be segregated specifically for use, Hope Scholarships, Pre-K, Pre and Technology. And it was segregated. So you couldn't, I mean, unfortunately, we're living through a time when the General Assembly is reducing general funds for education anyway, but I wonder what would have happened had they not segregated those funds from the start, how much less money from the general fund would be going into education. But that was, that was an incredibly smart way to, to handle this. It's unfortunate probably that hope has become so important and pre-K has been not left in the dust, but but it's obviously, I think, Zell's dream of pre-K has not been fulfilled the way I think he would have wanted it to have been. Zell Miller, you, you, you're talking about somebody who these progressive policies, these populist, yeah. uh, a populist Democrat of the, the old mountain you know, populism, yeah. but at the same time, somebody who could play some real hardball. Oh, he it, was, it, yeah. It, it, with with the, the story of, you know, pushing out, Transportation Commissioner Hal Reeves installing uh, Wayne Shackelford, yep. yep. sort of the right hand man of uh, Wayne Mason over in Gwinnett County um, as, as Transportation Commissioner. Uh, tell me about the impact that, that, that Zell Miller's vision beyond the Hope Scholarship. I, you can't separate Hope from Zell Miller, but beyond Hope, what is the legacy of Zell Miller 
in Georgia politics? Um, Zell was a, um, Zell was a pragmatic leader, but he was also an idealist. He was tough-minded, as you said. He could play hardball politics with the best of them, but he also had a big heart and his heart showed in the policies that he worked toward. You know, I will never forget the state of the state speech uh, where Zell, he was always about education and improving education, and I will never forget the state of the state speech in which he, uh, we, we were all informed at the last minute uh, in the press corps that, that Zell was going to add a little piece to his state of the state speech where he was going to talk about uh, the importance of classical music to infants and announced in his State of the State speech that they were going to make available to mothers across the state CDs of, I can't remember if it was Bach, Mozart, maybe it was a combination of them. And it was just this kind of wonderful Zell Miller touch that always mattered to me. I, I will tell you a very personal story. Yeah. Do, do you like want that kind of yeah, stuff? Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, you know, let me let me not go there. I, let me tell you a political story about Zell. Fair enough. Uh, and then I'll t I'll tell you the person. Um, we talk about the legacy of Zell and George, and, and hope and pre-K will always be the most important things that we re remember him for. I think, and we remember his courage. I mean, he he almost lost that lottery fight when when uh, it went to the voters who had to approve it, and then he almost lost re-election. Yeah, in 94. In right. 94, uh, and his political courage never failed him. But, but here's a point, here's a moment where he had an enormous impact on the country. It's by now become a legendary story that he was the first, one of the few statewide candidates across country who recognized the talents of uh, Carvel and Begala brought them in to run his 90 gubernatorial campaign, and they were enormously successful against Johnny Isaacson. But um, what is fairly well known now is that when Bill Clinton was looking at getting his campaign up and running for president, he came over from the governor's office in Arkansas to talk to people here about 92 race. It was this was sometime in maybe late 90, early 91, and he spent the night at the mansion with Zell, and they stayed up all night talking, and at one point, Clinton said, well, I've got to figure out how to put together a team. And Zell literally picked up the phone and called Carvel and said, I think you two should get to know each other. And it was Zell who turned, helped Clinton win the election and then made Carvel and Begala, you know, international political right. superstars. But here's what a story that most people don't know. The, uh, in 91, in the late fall of 91, it may even have been as late as November or later, that uh, the Democratic Party, the, the DNC, held its off-year uh, gathering in Los Angeles. And a couple of us went out to cover it because some of the early candidates for president wanted to be there, and we thought we should watch him. Tom Baxter, at that point, columnist for the AJC, right. was out there with me. And Zell was out there. And um, one afternoon, we got somebody from Zell's office, whether it was Steve Wrigley, Keith Mason, who knows, said, hey, Zell wants to talk to you. Uh, can you come meet with him? So uh, I went to this meeting room. Baxter was there. Zell came in, and he said, I want to talk to you off the record. And we said, great. What do you want to talk about? He said, well, how would you feel? At, at, these were the days when George's primary, we were coming into 92, to the presidential primary season. And in those days, we had a late primary. Right. And Zell said, I just want to take your temperature, guys. Uh, I'm thinking about going back to Atlanta and asking the legislature to move our primary date. Well, what, how do you think people would react to that? How would your viewers, your 
readers react to that. And frankly, it just didn't seem like a big issue to me. Um, so we kind of, I think Baxter and I both said, well, yeah, fine, Governor. <laughs> you know? Will they move it? What do you think? And it was only the presidential primary that we were going right, to the move. Preference, right. The presidential preference primary. Uh, well, he did that for, for Bill Clinton. He wanted Georgia to be a firewall for Clinton in case things went south in Iowa and New Hampshire. He wanted to assure that Clinton would come into Georgia n after New Hampshire and be able to come away with a big victory. It was a gamble. He didn't know how Georgians were going to react. Jesse Jackson was in that, in that race. But Zell in the fall or early winter of the year before said, I want to help my friend Bill Clinton. And so when Clinton came in third in the New Hampshire primary in that year, despite this comeback kid nonsense, which Carvel and Clinton picked up, comeback kid, he was third. Still third place. <laughs> uh, but he came in, to, he flew from Manchester to Atlanta to a rally at the uh, at this, what was then called the Omni, the CNN Center, mm -hmm. and Zell truly did help revive Bill Clinton's campaign and send him off on a track toward winning uh, the nomination. So he was a remarkable political thinker, and uh, it was always fun to talk politics with Zell. And and of course, <clears throat> later in his career, you know, after after his two terms. <clears throat> um, Governor Barnes appointed yeah. him to the U.S. Senate. Yeah. And there was a Senate campaign after after the untimely death of, of, of Paul, Tuck, Paul, Coverdale. Paul Coverdale. Uh What was it like covering Zell, <laughs> Zell Miller and the, the, the Mac Mattingly, the, the once uh, you know, 1980, you know, the giant slayer taking down Herman Talmadge just before your time yes. in Georgia. What, what was it like covering that that election? And then, sort of the, the the later iterations of Zell Miller, which which have become infamous, famous. Well, uh, let, of late. yeah. Look, I, okay, I do have a theory about what happened to Zell. Okay. And I'm not sure that it's uh, I, it is speculative, but I think it's speculative based on a certain understanding of him and the situation he found himself in. I remember visiting, and we're talking now, of course, about the fact that uh, by 2000. Uh, 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 eight, uh, Zell was firmly in the Republican camp. He was all for George W. He gave that infamous uh, keynote speech at the Republican convention in which he trashed John Kerry and the mm. Democrats. Had a <laughs> a very funny fight with Chris Matthews. My, my introduction to Georgia politics <laughs> which came, came, got back to my dorm room freshman year, turned I, on the TV. I talked to Chris about that a couple months ago, and he said, you know, Zell and I did make up. And I said, I'm glad to hear that. But um, so here's what I think happens. I went up to visit Zell while he was in the United States Senate, and before he really went whole hog uh, into his uh, anti-democratic mode. He told me while I was up visiting with him that he was starting to work on a new book. And he said, I'm writing about what hap what I'm writing about people who have served as governors of their state and then gone on to the United States Senate. And I thought about that a lot as Zell made that political pivot. Because I think what happened to him, as it happened to others, and he understood this, is that when you're governor, you're the CEO of the state. You run it. Especially in a state like Georgia, course, which has such a powerful exactly. governor. Exactly. He could, he, within reason, he could do what he needed to and wanted to do, as long as he could win support. When you're, you become a member of the United States Senate, you're one of a hundred guys, and the process of getting things done, as we all know today, is stullifying. And for a guy like Azell Miller and other governors whose careers he was going to talk about in his book, incredibly frustrating. And it has always been my sense that Zell is an individual 
who wants to be heard, who wants to be, and I don't mean heard out of ego, I mean who felt he had ideas that needed to be heard, wanted to stand out, didn't want to be one of that gray pack. He's a, he's a college history professor. Yes. He wants to lecture. And so an opportunity to do that, uh, in addition to, I think, a change to extent in his political philosophy came when he decided to be as helpful as he could to George W., President George W. Bush. I, I've never had a chance to ask Zell if he regrets the tone he took in that keynote speech, whether he went too far, but I do think it's realistic to suggest that he felt frustrated uh, by the position he'd gotten himself into in the U.S. Senate, and that to some extent informed what happened in his later years uh, in public office. Well, you, you mentioned he's, Governor Miller has been a prolific writer, yeah. and, and one of the most famous books he's written is, is, is A National Party No More. Yeah. Where you know, he, he, the main thrust for those who, who haven't read the book is, is, is that a leftward drift of the Democratic Party right. uh, had doom, doomed his Democratic Party in the South. Uh, and you mentioned earlier that, that the perception, real or, or, or otherwise, that the Democratic Party in the state of Georgia, in the South, in the nation, is the party of liberals, intellectuals, racial and ethnic minorities. Yep. One, is that true um, here in Georgia? And two, what have been the implications of that? Well, I mean, uh, you know, depending on when someone decides to watch us sitting here talking, uh, we're going to have a pretty good example, pretty good opportunity to find Excellent out point. what the Democratic Party Excellent is in point. Georgia. It, in this gubernatorial race. Um, so s some people will probably, I, whenever you put this up, mm -hmm. people will already know the answer to this or they'll be uh, waiting to see what the answer, I mean, look, you have a governor's race with, um, and the Democratic side with Stacey Evans, with, interestingly enough, the support, uh, particularly of Roy Barnes, mm -hmm. a white suburban Democrat who believes that she can revive the Yellow Dog Democrat coalition. Buddy Darden as well. Buddy is on her side. Mm -hmm. um, that's right, there are any number of those leaders. Um, can she energize those, those Yellow Dog Democrats? The, the suburban women who used to vote mm -hmm. Democratic with some regularity, the rural white uh, voters who were in Zell Miller's day, always voting Democratic. Joe Frank Harris as well, you know, sort of that exactly. Bartow well, County. Well, going back for, sure, you know, sure. forever in Georgia. <laughs> right, right. Um, or Stacey Abrams, African-American, who uh, believes that her path to victory will be to energize what has become the new base of the Democratic Party, African-American voters. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that's going to tell us a lot about where this state is headed in terms of democratic uh, politics. Well, it's, you know, we, we've talked about, you know, the Democratic Party is, is, is the party of African Americans and, and other minorities, um, Hispanics, yeah. Asian Americans, especially in, in Gwinnett County. Yeah. Uh, the Republican Party has, has, for all intents and purposes, since the 1990s, been the party of white Georgians. Right. How much do you think the the reforms that Governor Nathan Deal has tried to to push through very effectively in some cases in terms of criminal justice reform, yeah. sentencing reform, diversion programs. Yeah. Now you have have Nathan Deal making a push for ending cash bail yeah. here <clears throat> in Georgia, which which is I mean a, a progressive issue par excellence yeah. to to. Yeah. to a Republican governor from Gainesville, Georgia, uh, bucking the, the Georgia Sheriff's Association. Is he ahead of his party? Uh, and, and is there going, is that an effective way of the Republican Party building its base? Which, demographically speaking, we can talk about that in a little bit. There are some well, questions. Hey, okay. Uh, so start with the fact that Nathan Deal, of course, used to be a Democrat. So there's still some of that DNA that, 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 <laughs> in his system. A fair point. Um, Nathan Deal has had one of the most 
extraordinary career paths, I think, uh, in terms of philosophy of government of any candidate I've personally watched. You know, um, toward the end of his tenure in Congress, there was a sh brief period of time when Nathan kind of latched on to the whole birther movement. I mean, I don't think it's something to today that he is, I, I can be almost certain without even having to ask him that sure. he wouldn't be proud of that today. But for a short period of time, he sort of moved gingerly toward that. Sort of the, the Tea Party boomlet yes. period. Um, in his early tenure as governor, <coughs> he helped pass uh, what, what I think a lot of people saw as anti-immigrant legislation. And then he becomes this extraordinary, I mean, he deserves unbelievable credit for looking at the criminal justice system and saying, we are failing an entire population of people in this state, and most of them are African-American men. And so he puts yeah. in place these remarkable reforms that have become a model for the entire country. And for that, he deserves the, the credit he's gotten. It's, been a, it's just been an amazing thing to watch. Um, but that's not the only way. So you ask, could this begin moving uh, African-Americans, other minorities toward Republican Party? I think you should add a couple of other things in there that fight against the most conservative conventional thinking of, of uh, conservative Republicans in this state. He vetoed campus carry the first time around. Right. He vetoed religious liberty, and he didn't just veto religious liberty. He made a very powerful veto speech right. about uh, the fact that he believes that the Constitution of the United States already enshrines protections for those of us who are religious, whatever. Um, so I think he's been, he, <laughs> I say this on Political Rewind, uh, sometimes I say, I think Nathan Deal would hate it if he heard me now say he's a progressive. <laughs> but there are things he's done that have been very progressive. Do I think that's going to help move uh, African Americans to the Republican Party? No, because um, if he's running, I think there, it, you know, if he, in, I, you may know better than I what percentage of the African American vote he won in his last election. I don't know that number off I, the top of my head. I think it was around, it was between 5 to 10%, All right, so which, is a pretty, which is a pretty good... Yeah, uh, but it was still, it's not enough it's still 10%. to turn... The, uh, uh, yes. Right. So, um, no, because the Republican Party here is still the Republican Party, because there are still going to be conservative Republicans who are taking on issues uh, and promoting issues. I mean, look at the can Republican candidates for governor. Right. They are all running way... To the right. Uh, we just heard Casey Cagle, uh, who is the front runner for the Republican nomination. Uh, it, there's a new PAC spot out, just came out, uh, in which it uh, talks about Cagle, his opposition to sanctuary cities, his determination to shut down illegal immigration. I, I'm not going to judge whether that's an appropriate position or not. I know there are many people who think it is, but that's not going to help win over minority voters for the Republican Party. Right, right. You know, the, the so we, we had one of those campaigns in Virginia with Ed Gillespie exactly and, and, right. and Ralph Northam. And That's right. Georgia is not necessarily Virginia, but yeah. demographically right. speaking, right. It, yeah. it, it is trending the way of, of a Northern Virginia, of a Fairfax, Loudoun. Yeah. Look, we, you know, you allowed me to take a minute to talk about what are we going to learn between Ab Abrams and Evans. Look at scenarios. What if Abrams is the nominee against Casey Cagle? There's going to be a great lesson to learn there as well. Right. Actually, you know, are, are Georgians, do Georgians continue in a state that Trump won by just five points? Are Georgians going to continue embracing Republican ideas to get tough on immigration as one of the big ones? Um, uh, you know, uh, will a Kegel or another Republican candidate continue con criminal justice reform? What about civil liberties? Is there, should there be a civil rights bill for gays and lesbians and others in the state? I mean, are voters going to continue supporting Republican ideas or have we come 
to that moment so many Democrats are eager for, which is, no, the tide is turning. We've had Democrats elected in Republican legislative districts. Right. It, this is going to be one of the most interesting years to read the mood and thinking of Georgians that we've had in, in decades, I think. Well, we, 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 <clears throat> talk, we talked about sort of the, the, the division within the, <clears throat> the Democratic Party, which if, if somebody was listening to this right now, they might say we're, we're taking a reductive approach, that it's just race. And, 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 and sure, there, there is difference of opinions in terms of education reform, hope scholarship, Stacey Evans and her background versus Stacey Abrams. But within the Republican Party, you know, there, there's the, the hardliners, um, Josh McCoon from down in Columbus on, on issues of religious liberty, campus carry, the adoption bill yes. going through the Senate. Right. And then there's the uh, the other wing of the, the, the David the, Ralston, the 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 growth and development, right. the, the the Chamber of Commerce right. Republican, right. Uh, the Nathan Deal, Johnny Isaacson, yeah. Chris Carr, that that you know, is that the is that the real division within the Republican Party is the ideology versus that pragmatic growth and development wing of the party. Well. Those are different points of view within the Republican Party. I mean, it's no accident that the state Senate, even, even if it were not an election year in which we have so many people in the Senate running for statewide office, it is no accident that the state Senate tends to vote for hot-button right. uh, issues like religious liberty, uh, and the House tends to stand firm, a republican control. Uh, uh, House and Senate, I mean, that does show us there's a division. But I have yet to see that that division has much of an impact on who gets elected to statewide office, because when it comes down to it, what Republicans have is some fairly consistent core principles that voters have come to understand and embrace and Democrats here and across the country are still kind of, we know one of the big questions after the Trump election has been what do Democrats stand for? So yeah, sure there are divisions. Josh McCoon and David Ralston are not really in quite the same Republican party, but I don't think it's gonna have an impact on whether David Schaefer becomes Lieutenant Governor or Casey Cagle becomes Governor in that sense. Republicans will vote, Repu now, Democrats will vote Democratic too, but or they may not turn out, and that's a bigger issue, I think, for Democrats. Right, but but you know, like you mentioned, um, Democrats winning Republican legislative districts. Uh, Jen yeah, Jordan I mean, things here are changing in, a bit over over in Athens. Yeah. Uh, the, the, yeah, but the, we'll the blue, see if that the blue election dot. holds next year. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, with Deborah Gonzalez and yeah. uh, and, and uh, Jonathan Wallace, right. right? You know, will John Ossoff in, in, in the Georgia Sixth Congressional District? Uh, I'll admit, never heard of the guy right. until until qualifying. Yeah. Uh, but was somehow able to find 48% of the 6th Congressional District. Yeah, but I don't think that was about Ossoff. That was about, right. a, a, about a state, I mean, about a district responding to the shock of Donald Trump's victory. Right. I mean, the fact of the matter is that John Ossoff, as a lovely guy with ideas, uh, was always, from the start, a flawed candidate. And the biggest issue of all being he didn't live in the district. And that he was from the 5th Congressional District. <laughs> <laughs> Which he has rectified that that uh, yeah, yeah, but go ahead. What yeah, I I want to I want to get a sense of you know your your analysis of what it would take for the Democratic Party of Georgia. You know, it's been shut out of the governor's mansion since two thousand two, two thousand three, mm -hmm. the legislature since two thousand five, mm -hmm. statewide office since two thousand ten. Right. What is it going to take for the Democratic Party of Georgia? You, know, you came here in 83 when Republicans were the non-entity. Right. That you know, outside of the metro area, yeah. outside of, of the second congressional yeah. district down with Sanford Bishop, down in the, 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 the plantation belt, the Democratic Party has been relatively negligible. 
what's it going to take for Democrats? What, what's the road back to, to, to political competition, political power look like for Georgia Democrats? Um, I think the first thing is strong and charismatic leadership. Um, you know, we know Stacey Abrams has that. Stacey Evans is maybe can show that she has that as well, although we, we know it a little more certainly about Abrams. Sure. Um, but, but, but that's, you know, do we have a strong, is there a strong Democratic leader who can help bring the party together around core issues and do it with a, a flair that's appealing to voters? Um, and what are some of those issues? I mean, look, it, it is certainly the, the issues that, again, I know, there's, I know that Ralston is on one side, Josh McCoon essentially is on the other in terms of how, we bring, how the Republican Party functions. But the reality is that, um, well, I was going to say something I don't think is true. I was going to say that I think Republican voters still embrace a lot of the McCoon agenda, and I'm not sure if they do or not, actually. We'll see. Maybe we'll find out. But um, I think Republicans continue to have a better known brand. What do we stand for? Right. Lower taxes, uh, first and foremost. Um, making sure that the state is as much that... that Making sure that that the state, the policies of the state don't support only the more minority communities, the poor people of Georgia. How we're spending uh, uh, federal dollars in the state. I mean, I think there's that whole range of Republican issues which still have a big appeal here, and it's going to take somebody on the Democratic side who can do one of two things: either be Stacey Evans, who convinces those that former democratic coalition that she's more effective at doing the things that they want or a stacy abrams who says nope let's take things in a new direction this state is ready to move into the future i want to lead you into a time where we don't discriminate against gay and lesbian we don't discriminate against african americans and other minorities uh where we use the power of government for the good of i mean this is why we're going through this really fascinating year right now. Do you think? Do you think? Well, I, I, the issue I I always come there are two issues that I always I always come back to look at in, in we'll say the evolving priorities sure. of, of 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 Georgia politicians, especially the Republican governing majority, the gov right. the governing wing of the of the Republican Party, which is rural Georgia. And what to do? You, you came here in 1983. That was a couple years from the, the, the Charles Floyd piece on the two Georgias mm. rural Georgia versus metro Atlanta, essentially. And we can, you know, I think we can argue now there are three Georgias uh, suburban, urban, and, and basically the rural areas, mostly south of the fall line. Uh, and what, what to do with the, that, those depopulating, yeah. depopulating areas, de, de industrializing. You know, fly over Georgia, or, right. you know, drive through if you're going on I-16 or I-75, um, and then transportation. Right. The fact that we now have a Republican speaker um, and Republican legislator willing to discuss what is to be done with mass transit and rapid right. transit in places like Cobb County, Gwinnett County. Right. The, the the northern exurbs, which are going to be that the the big population of like Atlanta, well Forsyth and Cherokee County and, and Jackson County are really the future of, of of population growth in the North Metro, and you know I drive in from from Athens when I do interviews in in Atlanta. You can spend two to three hours on the road between sure. Athens and Buckhead, right? When you know it would take less time for me to drive down to. Bonaire, Georgia, and, right. and talk to, to, to right. Governor Purdue down there. Right. Uh, and I think that, you know, to, to, to put myself in, in, in sort of the interview is, is those are the issues that I think are, are telling in terms of the changing and evolving uh, priorities of the Republican Party. 
the willingness to use government in terms of r rural broadband, for example, mm -hmm. the way that Zell Miller and Joe Frank Harris used uh, the power of government for developmental highways, yes. the, the fall line freeway, corridor Z, uh, places, uh, thing, you know, policies like that, but also changing the gasoline tax, another hot button Joe Frank Harris era uh, issue, the, the, the fights between Joe Frank Harris, and Speaker Murphy and Governor, uh, Lieutenant Governor Miller and uh, the Tom Moreland uh, over the gasoline tax, the antiquated gasoline tax. That's right. Um, Don't forget to throw the sales, the grocery sales gro the tax three in the cents list, which Joe one. Frank worked very hard on for a long time. But right. go ahead. Right, right. But the, the willingness to to tack on a five dollar hotel tax or right. fee or you know whatever you want to call it to yeah. to make it relatively palatable, and all of that I think gets to the issue of 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 how the issues that, gov that Republicans and Democrats work on together, which is growth and development issues. If you look at the, the, the reform uh, of the transportation tax, the, the transportation bill passed by Democrats and, and metropolitan pro-growth Republicans right. over the opposition of the Tea Party Republicans, yes. which <clears throat> any tax is a bad tax. Um, yeah, that I think is is, is the future of, of of maybe it's the the past and the future of no, Georgia. No, but I think what you're saying, <clears throat> I think you've just done a wonderful job laying out the kinds of issues that Georgians uh, care about. I'm not sure I under I see that as necessarily issues that are going to accrue to one party or the other. So, for instance, by that I mean, um, <coughs> you, you talk about trans. I mean, one of the things the legislature during the 2018 session, the House, has done that was sort of a brilliant stroke, uh, was for a uh, Ralston to say, uh, "We're going to push transit in Metro. We got to work hard on it, and if we're going to do that, we better come up with something for rural Georgia as well." Which is why they created that that whole uh, group of people, the study group, to look at what is, you know, we need broadband, right. uh, we need help for micro hospitals, that sort of thing, healthcare right. delivery. Rural health so that was yep. smart. But here's why I, I wonder, and maybe you should tell me this, we should talk about yeah. this dialogue about this. Um, it strikes me that it doesn't matter if you're a, uh, if you're a legislator, Republican or Democrat, from uh, Vidalia, I don't know whether it matters if you're a Democrat or a Republican about trans. So for, let me say it a different way. A rural legislator, regardless of party, is going to be held accountable for voting to uh, spend more money more of his taxpayers' money on transit, maybe. I'm not sure that's an issue that one party or the other is going to be able to embrace. I think you're right that the House particularly, well, yeah, particularly the House has vision and understands that they cannot continue to be the party of, you know, no taxes, uh, fight transit, we need more roads. and I think they get that. But I think as you drill down into the legislative seats and that sort of thing, that's a hard vote whether you're a Democrat or Republican who lives in rural Georgia, right? Well, I, I think the, 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 real, the real test is going to be after reapportionment in 2021 right. where you're going to have an – I mean, th this has been the story since the 1970s and 1980s, which is an upward movement. Uh, upward geographically in terms of the number of seats north of the fall line. Right. I, I think Jim Galloway said on on the program not too long ago, you're you're going to look, you're going to be having Senate, state Senate seats or districts the size of congressional districts down in in South Georgia, sure, because South it's Central Georgia. It's deep, deep, yeah. So so we're going to be talking about fewer of those rural South Georgia. That's right. That's right. It's all going to be moving toward metro. It, it, it's it's going to be there are going to be more seats in, in South Metro, North Metro, um, 
the city in, inside the, the the city of Atlanta is finally adding population. Yep. Um, reversing decades of, 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 of outward movement to, to, to North the Cab and Gwinnett right. and, and, and Cobb County. So that I think the changing makeup of the legislature is going to, most likely there's going to be a nexus between those evolving priorities and the evolving shape of the Democrat, or the, 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 the shape of, of the electorate, um, of where people are living and yeah. voting. Um, and I think that's probably going to be very telling in how Georgia grapples with those issues. I, I think that's a really smart observation. Um, and it is, again, by the way, it goes back to something we talked about a long time ago, which is it's one of the reasons you have to look and see how many uh, statewide candidates for governor, say, can come from right. rural areas of the state these days because that's not where the voters are. So it's right, the same kind right. of thing. Right. And essentially what we have is, 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 is I think, Senator, State Senator Mike Williams, who, who is from Atlanta, the Atlanta right. metro area, right. uh, sort of projecting himself as the candidate of, of I don't want to call him the Donald Trump-like candidate. Well, he, he is. Bombastically yeah. in terms of the, 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 the yeah, rhetoric. I mean, he, and, and but, but he is. He's looking to make out, right? He and his campaign manager uh, uh, have decided that the way to get attention in this field is to make outrageous statements. And, and on the other hand, you have uh, uh, the more uh, uh, Brian Kemp, Secretary yeah. of State yeah. from, you know, from Athens, my fellow, my fellow Episcopal, uh, Episcopalian over in, in Athens, as sort of the, the, the governor of the other Georgia, the, the, the rural, you know, casting himself as the agriculture commissioner yeah. he always wishes he had been. Right. Um, but at the same time, are the, is that the base of the, 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 the Republican Party anymore? That, that sort of rural, all government is bad, or, 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 or small government, what does small government mean? Okay, but, but okay, I hear that, but again, if I'm a Republican in Alpharetta and I have Brandon Beach, the Republican, as my state senator, and I think, thank goodness, people like Brandon are finally standing up for our need to have transit, how, how is it, 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 as the population shifts to Metro, I don't think that necessarily changes the dynamic of whether we're electing Republicans or Democrats. Um, it's just it's more about the issues that mm. drive people to the polls, isn't it? Right. Oh, and I, it reminds me of the, an interview I did with 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 Ed Lindsay, who's oh, been a, a yeah. who's been a, a, a guest on your show. He, he ran for Congress in right. 2014. And, 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 and what Mr. Lindsay said was that was a torches and pitchforks election. I was out there talking about the issues of transit, right. of, of, of you know, targeted growth, yep. the, the use of government, and that's not what the electorate wanted to hear. Yeah, and he's, he's like, it was a fair fight. Everybody, I got to be heard, uh, but the people disagree. So it gets to the issue that you're talking about: is, is you can have those ideas, you can bring them to the electorate, and, but at the same time, at a cost-benefit analysis of of Yes, these things are important to people. They know they're an issue like traffic and sprawl, but where are they on the priority? Well, list? I hear that, and I think Ed is right to have described his race as a torches and pitchfork collection. Question becomes, will 2020 be a torches and pitchfork collection? The Trump election was such an anomaly in so many ways and for so many reasons. I mean, this anger that we hear so much about bubbling up from the, the, the invisible uh, voter uh, white, uh, middle class, uh, blue collar voter. Um, I get it, and it was a real factor, and and it and and to, right now it still is, but as you again filter these things down to state levels, to to legislative district levels, that sort of thing, is are we looking at a 2020 election that's still driven by the anger of people who feel they've been. Uh, overlooked, passed by, or when you talk about the population centers shifting to metro, are there going to be this whole range of issues which have to do 
with how people live their lives every day and whether government is working to help them live their lives better or not, as in transit. So I think that's all really interesting stuff to think about, mm -hmm. but it's probably, you know, I don't think there's any question that it's smart that to use transit as the number one example, that Republicans are embracing it because there's no question that by 2020, voters are going to want to know how are you helping me in my day-to-day -day life. So I do think there's a sh been a huge shift there. Look, we lost the t blast in every voting district, save one, in what year, 20... Oh, was that 2010? Uh, two, it was, I think, 2012. 12? 12, okay. I, 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 I'm I think terrible. We At have my age, I forget. Yeah. Every year. So, all right. yeah, the point I, is, the T Splash lost I think it's all but one district at a time when people just weren't ready. But boy, are they moving fast in the other direction now. But I'm not sure that accrues to Democrats as opposed to Republicans. Even though we, because there have always been pro-business Republicans who felt we needed to do it. So I'm just not sure the biggest issues that we're continuing to look at, um, except for those hot button issues, you know, civil rights issues for gays and lesbians, uh, how, where we allow guns, those issues will always be uh, operating along the partisan divide. But are the biggest issues, it, it, it can Republicans position themselves as effectively in those kinds of issues as Democrats? Well, I, I think I think that really gets to the point. It, it is if you go back and look at the George. I've got Busby's, about ten, 10 minutes, minutes. Okay, you go look back at the George Busby's, the Joe Frank Harris's yeah. of the world, and and you measure their priorities and the priorities of a Nathan Deal and a Casey Cagle. And where is the daylight in terms of, mm -hmm. of, of policy priorities, uh, appropriations? Higher education maybe is different. It, it's definitely down from, yeah. from where it was under Zell Miller and Roy Barnes. But w would, a, would, a, would a Joe Frank Harris or George Busby have pursued an Amazon HQ2 just okay. as aggressively yeah. as Nathan Deal right. has? Yes. Yeah, I think, well, yeah. Um, I, I think that's a. I'm trying to think point. if I had a question in there, but, but maybe the question is is, there, is it just the party label that has changed in, in your, your 20 to 30 years of covering politics? What has really changed in terms of the, the, the priorities of the governing party? Uh, I think there are some issues like a transit issue that have changed, Excuse me. but keeping government spending down, you know, now no wasteful government spending, keeping my taxes lowered, uh, those are the kinds of uh, core issues that haven't changed at all. Um, you know, it's interesting you mentioned Joe Frank Harris because uh, there is an example of a guy who's started working on an issue that we continue to struggle with to this day that uh, that doesn't strike me as accruing to one party or the other. QBE? Yeah, the Quality Basic Education Act was the first really big uh, policy uh, 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 measure that I covered uh, with the Joe Frank Harris administration. And it was You know, they never sold it this way because they knew it would be dangerous to do so. But what it was all about was finally removing the last vestiges of the old SEG school system from the state, an effort to equalize funding uh, for schools across the state of Georgia. And of course, we've, know, we've seen in the, and that in itself was a bold and important step in the right direction. Uh, but here's an example of a measure that, again, you, how do you look at this in terms of partisanship? I mean, you're talking about it, and we, we, you know, Nathan Deal was going to revisit it. He promised he'd revisited it. He would revisit it, and of course he didn't. Um, so where do people, how do people vote on that? Do they line up on that sort of thing 
if they were given, if they could vote for, as they voted for politicians who support it or oppose it. Uh, let's say Nathan had taken up QBE and said, we need to change the formula. And remember, of course, the formula is based on uh, a richer school system, Cobb County, Gwinnett County, whatever, uh, to, to do their part where they have a higher property tax base, all that sort of thing. We're going to take a portion of the tax revenues they collect and we're going to send it to a poor district somewhere in South Georgia. That's a bold idea. Joe Frank passed that. It didn't do enough. And we've seen one reform plan after another come and go. Roy Barnes had a remarkable reform plan. Sonny Purdue through. Zell had some plans. Roy had plans. So here's Nathan Deal, and he comes along in his first term and says, one of my big agendas will be to redo QBE. And he finally realized that there isn't any hotter third rail issue than quality-based education, because how does he go back to Cobb County and say, oh, I want you to send even more money to Quitman or wherever. Okay, so I, that's a long way of saying, is that a Republican issue or a Democratic issue? We, we sort of saw that it, the, the same questions with, with school choice or the school takeover, or however you want to. Right, exactly. The, the language the opportunity you use, school district. Which, which are very cross cutting in terms of the Democratic Party over in Clark County, for yeah. example. Huge opposition to it, but the opposition didn't break a lot. African American uh, voters voted disproportionately in favor for for a, a key Republican uh, so, okay. plan. So if but it's, yeah, it's, it's interesting. So big issues like that are not you can't look at them as in terms of how you're going to vote Democratic or Republican. Is it possible that an awful lot of how we vote in this state, like other states, is based on? Uh, I don't want them to get as much as I get. I don't care if you're a Republican or a Democrat. I don't like those people. The so tribal, if you're planning tribalism. on helping them instead of me, you're not getting my. I just, I wonder how, yeah, how primal our choices are going to be in the years ahead. That silly kind of, what I just said makes no sense. But it does raise questions about uh Again, we're going to learn a lot about that in 2018. Can, it, can an African-American Democratic woman uh, mobilize the people who have felt left behind and take them all the way to the governor's mansion in November? Or is this state going to continue to be a state that's dominated by conservative white voters uh, whose, interests are, whose value interests have to do with paying less tax don't want a lot of immigrants uh, in, in, in our state because they feel they're bad for the economy. Um, I think those are our core issues. But whether we have transit or don't have transit, um, I don't think that's a partisan issue. I don't think, you know, I think you better as a Republican candidate for governor this next time out embrace that just like a Democrat should. I don't know. Well, Bill. I, our, our time has, has come <laughs> to an end. I, I, I especially appreciate you turning the tables on me sort of towards the end of the, 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 uh, the interview. An old interviewer, it's hard to uh, get out of that mode. <laughs> the interviewee became inter began interviewing the interviewer, which, which is something new here for the two-party Georgia project. But I appreciate your time. Appreciate yeah, your insight. Yeah, thank you. I really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you very much. Uh, and by the way, uh, I turn the tables because I'm, one of the reasons that I think Political Rewind is a success, and, I, and I'm very proud of the fact that we've, it has been proven a success, has to do with the fact I really do want to hear what other people are thinking, even if I'm not sure I agree with what they're going to say. <laughs> well, well, it is a good and fair plug because it is, it is a good and fair show. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, many of, many uh, interviewees uh, and participants in the project have been, uh, have been regular guests um, on the show. Good. Thank you very much, sir. Thanks. Appreciate it.